Without further ado, um, let's give a warm welcome to Ms. Nash and Mr. Lucas. So I didn't know if, if I, we were letting you know that we're ready to speak or just let you know we're not going to walk out the door on you. We're here because you've, you've built us up as being heroes and we have all the answers. Um, I wish I had all the answers because then I could sell them. But what we do want to do is make sure that you guys have information about what to expect. What do I expect for my child at a particular level? And also, where can I go as a parent for help? And um, once it's said and done and you get these scores back, what do they mean? So that's kind of, of our take and, and what we want to go with today. So in North Carolina, there are, are basically... There's lots of exams. Teachers are going to give teacher-made exams, and you're going to have all types of things. Even our, our K-2 students are going to have assessments that they have to do at the end of the year. It's part of school, right? But what we're going to focus on today are, um, are these three types of required exams in North Carolina. So one is career and, edu and technical education exams, and um, Chip is going to talk about those in just a few minutes. But those are basically for students who are enrolled in particular career and technical education courses. So, you know, your high school student who might be enrolled in accounting one, there is a state exam for that particular subject area. Okay, so, and he's going to talk more about, about those things. Then you have your end of grade exams, which are for your students in grades three through eight in reading and math, and then fifth and eighth grade in science. And then you have your end of course exams, which are um, mostly your high school. We do have some middle school students who may be enrolled in an end of course subject area, and we'll talk about those. But Biology English 2, NC Math 1, and NC Math 3, those are required. There's a state required assessment at the end. So these are the three that we're going to focus on um, and talk to you a little bit about today, making sure that you kind of have those resources and that information. So first, we're going to talk about high school. We're going to kind of go backwards. We're going to talk about high school first and then work our way down to the elementary, okay? So first, we're going to talk about, well, not me, Chip is the expert in career and technical education, so he's going to talk to you about the CTE exams. Uh, thank you, Kim. As she mentioned earlier, in career and technical education, we do have some required state examinations, and this is what you see on the screen. But just as she said that other grade levels have assessments in career and technical education, there are two other what we call proof of learning in career and technical education. One is like a performance-based measure. The other is credentialing. But for today, we're talking about these state examinations. So we have a, a, a large course inventory. About a third of them are in the state-required um, assessment. A program and it just depends on when the course is made how they're assessed some are going to be assessed with as I mentioned a credential a, a portable certification that they leave the classroom with or like a rubric based performance based measure or these um, 32 assessments that are still main, mandated by the state okay and they we're in seven different program areas that you can see range from business to agriculture to culinary arts to health sciences and some of the trades and marketing areas. Our state assessments are 100 multiple choice uh, items. Uh, they are centered around the standard or the objective in the particular area and the number of items is based on that course weight in what we call the blueprint of our courses. Um, on our assessments of those 100, the estimate, estimated time that you can complete for the assessment at the end of the course is two hours recommended. But of course, within um, career and technical education, if you have any type of uh, additional needs around extended time, that length can be a maximum of four hours to make sure that you have achieved or the student has all of his or her accommodations. And our, uh, the way ours are uh, scored, um, our, our, most all of our students take our assessments on a laptop or a um, Chromebook, and we take it through a platform called um, CTE, um, uh, NC Test, and CTE has its own platform within NC Test. And so the way that they're scored, they're um, scored for the courses in that standard course, uh, in standard status, and they are scaled. 
And the scores, if the student makes 70 or higher, they are considered proficient. 70 out of 100, meaning that they would be proficient. If they score at 90 or higher, then that um, reflects definite mastery of those um, course standards. So that's just a little snapshot of how career and technical education is assessed in the state um, mandated um, uh, assessment area. Okay, so um, thanks, Jim. <laughs> Other high school assessments um, that are mandated by the state occur if your child is enrolled in biology, English 2, math 1, or math 3. So, and again, this is based solely on course enrollment. You know, if you haven't had a child get through, get all the way to high school yet, basically it's whatever course they enroll in. It's not like grades three through eight where everybody takes reading, math, science, social studies. They, they choose or they progress based on their historical grades and what they've been able to master and go, go forward with. So there may be ninth graders that take math one. There may be ninth graders that um, take English two, believe it or not. So that's typically a sophomore course, but it's all based on course enrollment. And basically this is the layout and um, the yellow is biology. Items, the number of items, approximately 60. Okay, somewhere around 60, depending on the test, could be 65. Those items could be, and we're talking at high school level now, we're, we haven't got to the littles yet, but they could be multiple choice. They could be what's called technology enhanced items. So it might be a drag and drop, where you have a, a portion of a sentence and you drag it and drop it to replace something else. Um, it might be a text selection where you select a, a, you click on something in a paragraph that doesn't fit or doesn't belong, okay? Um, it could be where you click or drag a piece of a, a graph or something to that sort. So there are different types of items. There's also what's called constructed response, which is basically what we used to call back in the day, fill in the blank. You type in your own answer. You don't have answer choices. Okay, um, and those could, could appear in any of those. Um, for English, the um, English 2, the students will have to read seven selections. There are, they vary in length and in difficulty, um, but all aligned to the English 2 curriculum. The amount of time um, could go from two, two and a half hours, three hours, depending on the test, with a maximum of up to four hours, again, depending on the test. Okay, that is unless a, a child ha is identified um, with a 504 or in the Exceptional Children's Program and they have additional um, modifications to their testing environment. But that's basically the layout of the assessments. High school testing dates. Okay, so I put these here just for your awareness, but I do want to kind of point out that EC students um, those in our exceptional children's department or those who have to do makeup testing may actually test on dates other than what you see listed. Okay, this is just where the majority of our students will test for those particular calendar days. But for example, May 22nd, I believe is on a Tuesday. Some of our exceptional children may test on that Monday. Okay, um, just because of testing environments, we have to make sure that we meet all of their modifications so we want to make sure that we have ample opportunity to do that so that's kind of our high school testing elementary and middle now you will have some middle school students again who may be enrolled in math one as an eighth grader okay they're going to take that same eoc as the high school students in those cases okay so that would take precedence over the eog but all of our other students in elementary and middle, there are assessments that begin for our EOGs in grade three and go through grade eight. At each one of those levels, there is a math assessment and there is a reading assessment. And then only in fifth and eighth grade do you see the science. Okay, those are the only two um, times that we test science at the state from the state other than when they get to biology in the high school. Um, there's a couple asterisks here. One is with that eighth grade um, math, and it could have also been in there for reading as well because we do have some students who would take English too early. But um, again, 
if they're enrolled in that math one, it takes precedent. They'll take that instead of the regular eighth grade EOG. It used to be that they would actually have those kids taking both. They don't have to do that anymore. They don't have to take one, but the EOC would take precedence, okay? And then the other asterisk that I have in here is for third grade reading. You may have heard of or be familiar with the Read to Achieve legislation that basically our goal is to have every third grade child reading by the time they leave third grade. So um, <clears throat> a student who is proficient on that test, there are other pathways and other ways for those students to reach that level. But if they make a three or higher on that assessment, it does satisfy that legislation, okay? Um, <clears throat> so that's why that asterisk is, is there for that particular subject area. So very similarly to our EOCs, EOGs, um, <clears throat> you have somewhere between 45, science actually has 65 um, approximately, but the number of items range in between 45 and 65. Um, there are different item types. Now, there are not as many different technology enhanced item types. There's not as many for our third graders as there would be for the high school kids. So they may not have the drag and drop but they may have something where they have to click in a picture, <coughs> excuse me, or a paragraph or something, okay? But the thing about the various item types is that students are required to take a tutorial before they take any of these assessments so that they can see the different types of items. The benchmarks that they've been taking have various types of items so that they have the practice with those item types before they take this test, okay? And then recommended hours, um, it's two hours is the recommended time. Most of our children are going to finish within two hours, but they can have up to three. And again, that does not include students who have been identified in our exceptional children's um, department and who may have additional modifications. So our dates again, we have traditional and year-round calendar. So again, these are the dates when the majority of our students will be testing. Okay, but we may have some that fall outside that window on either place and your testing coordinator would make sure that those parents and those students are informed prior to their particular test date. Okay, so I'm going to go over scoring real quick for EOG, EOC. Chip talked about his scoring and the 70%, 70% and 90%. Scoring for EOG and EOC is a little bit different. Okay, and some of you may be familiar with this. Typically, for the regular education student, um, you're going to see achievement levels. Achievement levels meaning that they would get not proficient or they would achieve a level three, four, or five. Okay, which is one of the things that one of you guys were mentioning in here about your daughter being nervous about that, achieving that. So basically, this is what that means. A level three is that they have demonstrated sufficient understanding. Okay, they're consistent, they've met kind of the sufficient understanding to say that they can move on to the next grade level. They may need some additional supports, but they're good. They've met those standards. A level four means that they've demonstrated a thorough understanding, okay? And then a level five is comprehensive understanding, all right? So that's kind of your levels. They kind of, they've got it enough, could be better, but they've got it enough to move forward. And they've got a little bit better, but they haven't mastered every single thing or they've mastered all of it, okay? So with that, the line is at the level three and to the right. Those students are basically, they're good to go to the next level, okay? Again, with the level three, they may need additional supports when they go to the next level. Level five, they should be okay, okay? They've mastered this. They've got a, a complete understanding of the uh, standards that were presented at their current grade level. Okay, so these are typically the scores that you would see on an EOG or on an EOC. You also get, let me go back, um, a little bit after, after your, your child takes a test in the um, PowerSchool parent portal. If you log in online, you get an individual student report. Okay, so that individual student report has lots of different things. It has the achievement level, and we're going to look at a sample as well. It does have the achievement level, but it also has a scale score, which is basically where 
There's different forms of the test, okay, and they basically take those, those raw scores and convert them to a scale score so that they can kind of compare them across the board. All right, so that's the first type of score that you see, and usually those numbers will be in the 400s, 500s, something like that if you've seen one before. Um, then you have a percentile. So the percentile score basically will show if you took the children that took that grade level test, and let's say that your child's percentile is 78 percentile, okay? What that means is that your child performed better than 78% of the students that took that test that day, okay? So that's what a percentile score is. If your child scored an 87 percentile, they scored better than 87% of the students that took that test. Then you're also going to have, for reading and math, you're going to have a Lexile score and a Quantile score. So basically what a Lexile score is, is it translates into a level of your child's reading ability. Okay, um, and I am going to give you um, a place or I'll show you where on your, your individual student report you can go to get additional information about Lexile. And then Quantile is very similar. It's just a math ranking that basically shows um, how well your child has demonstrated their ability to solve math and to learn new mathematical concepts. Okay, so they're very close. It's just one is related to reading, one is related to math. Okay? So this is a sample, and I know you guys have the printout. This is a sample of what the individual student report would look like. So what you see first, and this one is a reading sample. I gave you a reading and a math. So what you see first is almost like a little speedometer. It's going to give you your child's achievement level. Okay, so it's going to show that in this, this sample, this child scored kind of three quarters of the way to a four. If they're almost a five, it'll show that error will be even closer to that number five. Okay, and then this is where you can see that scale score in this particular grade level. Um, I think it's 624 to 648 would be not proficient. So this is going to be in the 600s. And it's going to show you, or it might be 500. I don't know. I'm right here and I still can't see. Um, <laughs> but it's going to show your student score. And then it's going to show you compared to the school. Then it's going to show you compared to the district and compared to the state. Okay, so in this case, this child did better than school, district, and state. And then underneath, you'll have an explanation of the achievement level. You'll have the percentile rank. So this child was at 60, 62. So they did better than 62% of the students that took the test. And then for reading, you're going to see the Lexile level. So in this case, that Lexile level is an 850. This is the math sample. The only difference in the math sample that you're going to see your number range will be different, okay? And then instead of Lexile, you're going to see Quantile. And it's going to give you that level for Quantile. And then if you have it in front of you, you can probably see it a little bit better. But when you get this report, it's electronic, right? So when you get it, there's a link that you can click on, and it'll explain to you more about the Lexile level, the Quantile level, and the different measurements that are on that document, okay? Um, currently, the only way that you can get your individual student report is if you log into the PowerSchool application online. They are working to get it where you can get it from the app. But currently, they don't have that, those pieces in place that would allow you to view that on, in the app status. They're, they're working on it, though, okay? All right, so resources and parent support. What can you do? What can you help other parents in your school do? So where do I go for help? The first place that I would always recommend that you go for help is to your child's teacher about opportunities for support. Your child's teacher knows what your child needs to know to be successful on that assessment. They should be able to pinpoint and give you specific resources to help your child. Okay, so that is by far the first place that I would go if you need support for your child to the teacher. There are some other resources. I gave you a couple websites. Um, there are links to these things on the Cumberland County School website as well under our, our um, data and accountability page. 
but you can go to DPI site to get just a family guide to assessment. What do I need to know? Okay, which basically is a lot of the information that we've gone over today. There's a place again where you can get an explanation of that individualized student report. There's a place where you can learn more about the Lexile and Quantile measurements. And then underneath um, is actually where I have linked our CCS website in the blue. You can get um, a list of the required assessments and you can also get released assessments. So what is a released assessment? A released assessment is basically an old test or a test comprised of questions that the state does not use anymore on their EOG or EOC. They've compiled them into a practice type test where at least your child could see these are the types of items that they may see on the test. A lot of our teachers use those in the classroom to help students prepare. Um, they, the question types um, could be very similar to what they see on the benchmark as well, okay, on those benchmark assessments. But you can go there and you can pull a PDF of those tests and just see diff different types of questions that they could be exposed to. So those are, are some good resources that you could go to. I would be careful not to just Google, how do I help my child with the North Carolina end of course test in a particular grade level? Because we don't know how old those sites are. We don't know how aligned those sites are. So these are the best places that you could go to get that information. And then what can you do as a parent? I have this year a third grader. He's testing for the first time. So what can I do? First and foremost in the, the circle on the left, stay positive. Kids are going to feed off of exactly what they see here about a test. So if parents are nervous, oh no, they're going to take their EOGs today. We've got to do this and this. They're going to feed off of that. If the teacher is nervous, they're going to feed off of that. Okay, so the best thing that you can do is stay positive about the test. I tell my child when it comes to his benchmarks, you know, he's like, Mom, we got a benchmark coming up. I'm like, honey, it's okay. This is your opportunity to show what you know. It's not a big deal. Read the questions, take your time, do your best, double check. Where it lands, it lands. They've basically been running this marathon all year long for this test. And they put all this pressure on themselves about this one day and this one test. Now, I work in the Data and Accountability Office, but I firmly believe there's never one number never one test, never one measurement that defines who a child is. So you help your children believe that too, okay? Just help them, encourage them, stay positive. Don't schedule appointments on the test days because then that makes them even more anxious because now I got to go make it up on a different day and I'm not in my class with the people that I'm normally in there taking a test with and I'm in a different environment. It might not even be my teacher that has to give me a test on a makeup day. So if you can avoid scheduling appointments, Avoid that. Make sure your child gets to school on time those days. Um, there are strict regulations around all of our testing. If the teacher has started reading directions, the child cannot enter the room. And it's not that we don't want them to. It's that we have these strict regulations that we have to follow. So if they're late to school and that teacher has started reading those directions, they've announced you may start testing, the child cannot go into the room. And it literally might be one or two minutes into the testing session. But those are the rules that we have to follow. Okay? Make sure your child gets plenty of rest the night before. You know, it's not the night to take them out to a, uh, um, you know, a brand new place, a ball game the night before that you know is not going to get over till 11 o'clock at night. It's not, not the time for that. Get them home. Get them rested. Keep that same routine going. Okay? Um, ensure they eat a healthy breakfast, avoid high sugar foods. That was my child's worst one on benchmark day. Because, um, <laughs> no, you can't have that cereal today because you're going to crash halfway through the test. You know, so um, that might be something on another day, but you, don't, you want to avoid those. And then encourage your, your child to start looking at things now. Okay? Um, it's not a stress thing. Not to add more stress. We don't want them stressed. We want them relaxed. We want them walking into that test being confident. So if they start looking through things now and you just start refreshing their memory now as they go along, then they're going to be more comfortable when they sit down to take that test. 
So it's really about, you know, we have test anxiety ourselves as adults. Like if we had to go in and take a test tomorrow on what we talked about in here today, 90% of us in this room would be like, now wait, what, what did they say? How do I do that? Because we, we automatically get nervous because we, we, we're being measured. We're being judged. We know all of these different things. So just help your child to get used to that environment early. The earlier, the better. You know, just, just tell them it's okay. Do your best. Read through everything. Double check everything. When it comes down to it, you know, as long as you've done your best. So, questions? Anything Chip can answer for you? <laughs> Sorry, Chip. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'll practice So, um, for our testing, the state does not require that there is a proctor in each and every room anymore. They used to do that. Um, they can have hallway proctors. So, they could have one proctor for several rooms. And, and forgive me, I don't have those numbers right off the top of my head how many rooms they can have, but they can have hallway proctors. Roving. Roving, Ro sorry. Roving, yeah. We're sorry. Roving, but yeah, roving hallway. Roving. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, one's a question, and the other one is a, a comment. Um, what do you recommend for decompression the night before the test? So, um, <clears throat> the first the first part of that the nighttime routine the night before for me what I found works even when as a classroom teacher leaving the classroom I want my students I want my kids to have the most normal what do you typically do you typically do not sit down and try to read your entire textbook the night before test so don't do it now okay because that's just going to add to the stress because once they start doing that and I'm not saying that they shouldn't prepare but preparation has to happen before just the night before. So if I sit down the night before and I start stressing, I'm gonna see a word like, oh wait, I don't remember seeing that before, and then I'm gonna get caught up in that. So I would say just keep it as routine as possible. If they have review materials from their teacher, go through those, you know, just kind of breeze through, check on some last minute things, but again, relax. If you typically, have your meal together, sit down together, and then you typically, you know, watch a show together or sit down and have conversation. Do that. Do that. Anything out of the ordinary <clears throat> typically will add stress to a child going to take the test. Um, in terms of the, the different types of stress, I think that it, that it comes down to knowing your child. Um, I have a um, very <laughs> strong child that's like, I need a five, mom. I need a five. My goal is to get a hundred. And so I'm, I'm talking him down from that because that's not a pressure I've put on him. He's done that to himself. You know, so I am just constantly reminding him, son, if you, if you take your time, you read the questions, you answer it. What I, only thing I want you to do is just go back and make sure your answer makes sense and then go on to the next one. You know, you don't have to because a lot of times, too, those, those kids that have to get that five also have to finish first. You don't, you don't have to finish first. It's not a race because you're going to sit there anyway. You know, that's the other part of the rule. You're going to sit there. So, um, you know, just go back to that. Do your best. Double check. Read. And just relax. You know, the ones that are struggling to pass, I would start encouraging them now. If they think they're not going to pass, Go ahead now. Have them talk to their teacher now. Or as a parent, talk to the teacher now. I know they've been struggling, but I know they want to do well. What do we need to start looking at now? You know, we're a month out. A little more than a month. So how can we, how can we do that? Chip, do you have anything else to add? I her original comment about just keeping it all positive, like she said, keeping it like the normal um, activities that she mentioned, and then just optimistic about it. It's, it's an opportunity for the student to grow uh, and to show growth from from the beginning of the course where they didn't know anything about it yes. to the end where they, they have learned something and, and just be hopeful that they have grown to those um, um, achievement levels. Mm -hmm. And in, in reality we want every child to demonstrate proficiency but we also are very realistic and know that children come to us at different levels with different abilities. So looking at a district, I mean, 50,000 children, they're not all going to reach proficiency. But what we want 
for every one of those 50,000 children is to be better at the end of the year than they were at the beginning of the year. So doing their best, going through that assessment, showing that growth. You know, are you, are you progressing? Are you moving forward? You know, that's, that's the other piece of this. You know, we just want to encourage them to be better than it was before. Oh, yeah. For the tutorial for the um, technology mm -hmm. advance, how far in advance are the teachers going over that with their kids? So I don't know how far they are going. I do know that it is currently available. So that it's really a site-based decision, but they could go over it at any time with the students so from now. Sure yeah, and we are talk. We will talk with the principals on Wednesday. They come for their leadership meeting, and we'll make sure that they know that that is out there as well, and that they could start taking a look at those tutorials. Yes, ma'am. Uh, for the EOCs in high school, yes. uh, does that become a part of the student's transcript, or is that it just does. for your data? Okay. No, it does. Um, the any time a child at the high school level takes an EOC and, and it's in their records even 3-8 you know it won't go with them um, once they leave here but it, it is on the transcript so for 9-12. So you should be able to see the mm -hmm. EOC from biology from first semester? Yes, <laughs> yes absolutely, absolutely. And I had a question about um, EOGs, if, so, if there's a student who does not, is not proficient, so doesn't mm -hmm. get a 3, mm -hmm. what's what is actually required? Because I've had parents be frustrated when there's a child who just maybe doesn't test well, and they're like, it, it doesn't matter, we're done. We're like, we got a fine grade in class, we're moving on to the next grade. Is that, what's the requirement? What would you like to see? So, um, for grades three through eight, grade placement is the discretion of the principal. So, you know, it, let's say that we are looking at at student performance throughout the year and then we're looking at the EOG and their level ones all the way across. They may need to be afforded that opportunity for additional time at that grade level. So they may have the recommendation to hold them back at that grade level. But it, it's a combination of those. The one assessment does not define for, for a child whether or not they're promoted. Even as the third grade read to achieve, if they do not pass those, the read to achieve legis legislation, sorry, doesn't mean that they have to stay in third grade. They can still go to fourth grade, but what happens is they'll have a little label that basically says that they are reading retained. So they are a fourth grader, but they have not met the third grade read to achieve legislation, so then they get another opportunity to meet it, okay? Now, for high school, high school grade placement is based on the number of credits that a child earns, okay? Um, so if a child has enough credits to move to the next grade, they can. But this is the difference in a high school EOC. Those exams count 20% of their grade, okay? So if I am sitting at a 65% for my coursework and I make a 50 converted score, I make a 50, that's gonna pull, probably pull me down to not being able to get that credit. So for a high school, that does count as 20% of their grade. And then credits determine grade placement in high school, okay? It's solely based on credits. You either have the credits to move to the next grade level, along with your English. English is a requirement for one of those credits, or you don't, okay? So if I pass seven classes, but I fail English one, I'm not gonna be promoted to the 10th grade because English one is a requirement of one of those, okay? Yes, ma'am. What happens if they refuse testing? Because I've had several friends that say that they don't want their kids tested. So, um, so I mean, I've never done it because mine does really good at testing, mm -hmm. but I was just curious of how that affects them in the long run. So as our state says that, that we test all of these children. Mm -hmm. So if the child is in school, if they are present any day during the 10 day window mm -hmm. for EOGs, They'll be tested. They have to be tested. We have to test them. The only, the only way that we don't is if there is a medical exception. Some medical reason why this child cannot <coughs> test, and these are usually severe. You know, the child was involved in a car accident, they're hospitalized. You know, or the child suffered this particular type of serious injury and they cannot test. Otherwise, basically what happens is when we talk about our school performance grades, Part of that, part of our grade and part of what happens is we have to test every child. If we don't, basically that score counts against the school. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens with the student 
Grade placement, again, grade placement is the discretion of the principal. So, you know, unless it is EOC and it comes to credits. So that one, you know, it would be up to the principal to, to make that determination. Okay, and we do, ha we do have some, some allowances too um, for testing outside the window. Like sometimes we have families, maybe are military connected, that, you know, maybe are being transferred out before that week. We actually have to file paperwork with the state to say, you know, can CHIP test during this time instead of during the regular scheduled window, and then that has to be approved by the state, then we could test CHIP outside of that window. Okay, but all of those are decisions that lie with the state legislation around the assessment, and so, you know, from our office standpoint, when they come, they're, they're going to be tested. And just additionally, what uh, Kim said about that 20% and the high school, those courses counting 20% of the final grade, same thing with the CTE, career technical education post assessments, that's in policy as well. Yes. Those students have to um, take those <coughs> exams um, so that they can have that portion count towards uh, their final grade. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have a question slash comment about testing the environment. Um, and this comes from a family. My child, and you know, at the last benchmark, the air conditioning was out. So these kids tested all of this benchmark week on hybrid land without air. I mean, they were hot. Like they said, the teachers had the label for trying to do whatever. And we all know if you get hot, you kind of mm -hmm. get struggling. Mm -hmm. So how, I mean, you can't foresee it, but so how do you all go about trying to ensure that the testing environment as a whole is fine. That's a good point. Because that raises stress levels. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, in, I mean, in a district our size, it's really the principal and the school administration. They, you know, are in charge of the building. And if there's a situation where you have a group testing in an environment like that, that they would need to make the decision to either, you know, find a different place for them to test or they or in a benchmark situation they would contact someone you know with the central office you know our department or the curriculum and instruction department explain the situation so that we can see if there are adjustments that can be made if they're within our power to make those adjustments to the calendar then we can definitely do that um, you know if it's a local assessment um, which benchmarks are local assessments that we can we definitely have a little bit more control over those types of things but ultimately um, you know, that would be something that the principal would need to evaluate and then make a determination if we need to relocate these students so that they can take that. Okay. You know, and I don't know if it was a whole building or a whole wing or, you know. How, how far in advance are testing calendars put out, like for, for the 23, 24 school year? Um, the so um, the 23, 24 school year. So we get the information from the state that says these are when the, the tests are you know, these are our windows, and then we choose the windows in between. So usually we get that towards the end of May. So over the summer, during that time, is when we look at the testing calendar to, to schedule all the different assessments that happen. You know, in high school, there's so many more that happen um, with the ACT and all the different pieces. So um, it is usually right before they, the teachers come back that that testing calendar will be finalized, and it is also available on the Cumberland County School webpage. When the kid needs that extended time, and he's the only one testing, that's a lot of stress on him because all the other it kids is. are looking like, hurry up, hurry up. It's bad. And they're trying to do their best. Yeah. And so can that kid be moved? No. Or can he? What is the... Again, and I, I, like, I, don't, I hate to even say this, but it really, again, comes down to the, the principal decision but if they're moved. Can you talk about that? Sure. Because we will definitely cover that in our testing meeting. And, you know, if there are... Yeah. If there are so situations where they need to move, like, yes. Up, up, around, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I'm just trying to like absorb all this. I have a kindergartner. Right? <laughs> 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 oh Slow down. Come back in a few years. <laughs> but, um, so I'm trying to understand like the process because also I've been out of school for a long time. So, <laughs> um, so if you have a kid that's uh, formed, you know, uh, well for every single benchmark that we're talking mm -hmm. about then they come and do the EOC and they bomb it like mm -hmm. they get an MD. Do you guys reconsider retesting or this is like one time like that's it you, you are not proficient period 
But then it's so, like your fives mm -hmm. all the way through, and then, I don't know, maybe you have like a horrible day. And there is um, what the state will allow. There is a second opportunity to test okay. that happens um, during the teacher work days. Okay. And so basically students who don't reach proficiency, and this is for the EOG and the EOC, if, you, if they don't meet the proficiency, they do have the ability to come back and take that test again to demonstrate proficiency. And there is a remediation in between where the teachers can work with them. Um, and so that also pairing with the transcript question about you know what test is on the 9-12 transcript. If let's say that I have in English 2, I had a level one, but I came back and, or not a level one, I had a not proficient, and I came back and took a retest, and then I got a level three. Both of those scores would show on the transcript. It would show the original score, but then it would also show that, re, that you know, second opportunity to test score. So we're testing them even though they pass, or I'm saying, you know, I, I feel like, I mean, if you get a three, you qualify, you pass. You're right, 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 right. It's, like, it's only if you're not proficient that right. you qualify. So is, a, is there like a district protocol that says, you know, instead of, um, now we just kind of accept it, well, this guy's an NP, and I guess he's gonna do third grade twice, or we actually, is that like per school, how does that work? So, um, where we see like I have an NT and then I activate the protocol of I call the mom, I call, you know, I call the district, I coordinate, I let you guys know, and then we all say, hey, we know, you know, four, four scores ago, he's, <laughs> you know, he's a three or a four, and, you know, mm -hmm. we're going to mandate him to come back and retest or, it's happen? never mandated, but the option is there. So as a parent, if, you, if your child tests and they're not proficient, you would get a letter that basically provides the details of that school's remediation plan and that second opportunity to test. And then as a parent, you have the option to opt in or opt out. So you can come and bring them to the remediation or you can deny that. Okay, it's entirely up to you. But remember in grades three through eight, grade placement is solely on the principal so you know it they could make they could make an NP and the principal still promote them okay. it's just it's used in conjunction with every other piece of data that they have okay but you will have an opportunity if the child is not proficient they do have the opportunity to come back and take the test again I just want to clarify did I hear you say that if people move outside of the district if they're under six, uh, ninth grade their test scores don't go with them their EOG scores do not. No, they, if they stay within North Carolina, they do, yes. They, they, they were scored. State, they do not. It's, it's still, it should, if that state enters the information correctly from the transfer process, it should still go with them. If they're you know high school and they've tested, those scores should go with them as part of their transcript. But if they're not in high school, they do not. They will follow the child, but when it comes to like college admission and, oh, and things like yeah. that, nothing's going to come from before ninth right, grade. Right, right, right. But yeah. Right. Yeah. Does that answer? About, so for military kids who yes. are going to different districts, if they're, if they, mm -hmm. obviously it's not the same test, but if they're Correct. looking at those scores determined, will you go to the gifted program, will you be in, you know, get a 504 here or there, Correct. that information. All that information goes forward. with the child. That's what I, I, yes. I misunderstood. You're yes, talking I'm about sorry. college. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Can we well, give them a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we give them one more round of applause?